Hello everyone, I'm Cloud Genius and welcome to this Cloud Practitioner Practice Exam. We're going to be going over some questions and the answers with explanations. So if you're preparing for this certification, make sure to check out my video on how I passed the AWS Cloud Practitioner Certification in seven days. Questions are extracted from my Udemy course, six practice exams with 390 questions. It's just a really good resource. So if you want more practice exams, if you want to practice and test your knowledge, this is the best resource. So the link is going to be below with a discount code already applied. Having said this, let's get straight into the practice exam. All right, so let's get straight into it, guys. The first question, a company has developed an e-commerce web application in AWS. What should they do to ensure that the application has the highest level of availability? Answer A, deploy the application across multiple availability zones and edge locations. Answer B, deploy the application across multiple availability zones and subnets. Deploy the application across multiple regions and availability zones. Deploy the application across multiple VPCs and subnets. The answer is C, deploy the application across multiple regions and availability zones. The AWS global infrastructure is built around regions and availability zones, and each AWS region has multiple isolated locations known as availability zones. In addition to replicating applications and data across multiple data centers in the same region using availability zones, you can also choose to increase redundancy and fault tolerance further by replicating data between geographic regions, especially if you're serving customers from all over the world. So the incorrect options, deploy the applications across multiple availability zones and subnets is incorrect. A subnet is a range of IP addresses inside of your VPC. Deploy application across multiple availability zones and edge locations is incorrect because edge locations are not used to host applications. They are used by CloudFront to cache and distribute content to your global customers with low latency. Deploy application across multiple VPCs and subnets is incorrect because the VPC refers to the virtual private cloud, which is a virtual network that you define. Deploying the application across multiple VPCs within the same region will not help global customers. A developer is planning to build a two-tier web application that has MySQL database layer. Which of the following AWS database services would provide automated backups for the application? Answer A, Amazon Aurora. B, a MySQL database installed on an EC2 instance. C, Amazon DynamoDB. D, Amazon Neptune. So let's reveal the answer Amazon Aurora. So Amazon Aurora is a MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible relational database built for the cloud. It combines the performance and availability of traditional enterprise databases with the simplicity and cost effectiveness of open source databases, delivers up to five times the throughput of standard MySQL and up to three times the throughput of standard PostgreSQL. So it is really a rocket. Amazon Aurora is designed to be compatible with MySQL and with PostgreSQL so that existing applications and tools can run without requiring modification. Now let's get into the incorrect options. First of all, a MySQL database installed on an EC2 instance is incorrect. You can install a MySQL database on an EC2 instance, but in this scenario, you would have to manage the database and the backup processes yourself. It would not be automatic. Second option, Amazon DynamoDB is incorrect. Amazon DynamoDB does not support MySQL. It is a no SQL database service. All right, you guys should already know about this. It's a really important thing to know. Amazon Neptune is incorrect. It is a graph database service, not a MySQL database service, and it is used to build and run applications that work with highly connected data sets such as social networking, recommendation engines, feeds, for example, the Instagram or X feeds or TikTok even feeds, right? And knowledge graphs. So that's the second question. Let's get into the third one. You have noticed that several critical Amazon EC2 instances have been terminated. Which of the following AWS services would help you determine who took this action? EC2 instance usage report, Amazon inspector, AWS CloudTrail, AWS trusted advisor. Let's reveal the answer, AWS CloudTrail. So AWS CloudTrail is a service that enables governance, compliance, operational auditing, and risk auditing of your AWS account. With CloudTrail, you can log, continuously monitor, and retain account activity related to actions across your AWS infrastructure. It provides event history of your AWS account activity, including actions taken through the AWS Management Console, SDKs, command line tools, and other AWS services. This event history is used to simplify security analysis, resource change tracking, and troubleshooting. The incorrect options are Amazon Inspector. It is 
is an automated security assessment service that helps improve the security and compliance of the applications deployed on AWS. EC2 instance usage report is incorrect. This report shows you your historical EC2 instance usage and helps you plan for future EC2 usage. All right. AWS Trusted Advisor is also not correct. It is an online tool that provides real-time guidance to help you provision your resources following AWS best practices. Let's continue with question four. Which of the below is a best practice when designing solutions on AWS? Use AWS reservations to reduce costs when testing your production environment. Invest heavily in architecting your environment as it is not easy to change your design later. Provision a large compute capacity to handle any spikes in load. Automate wherever possible to make architectural experimentation easier. Let's reveal the correct option. D, automate wherever possible to make architectural experimentation easier. So the third pillar of the AWS World Architected Framework is reliability. And these are the five design principles for reliability in the cloud. Automatically recover from failure, test recovery procedures, scale horizontally to increase aggregate workload availability, stop guessing capacity, manage change in automation. So these are five design principles for uh, reliability, and this obviously includes automating, all right? The incorrect options, instead of over-provisioning large compute capacity to handle spikes, you could use AWS ASG to handle these spikes, of course, by adding or removing instances based on the demand. Use AWS reservations to reduce costs when testing your production environment is incorrect. Reservations in AWS are not an appropriate choice when you need to test your production environment. And lastly, invest heavily in architecting your environment as it is not easy to change it later. It is incorrect. In AWS, you can test and provision your resources on demand and pay only for what you use with no long-term contracts, right? This is the elasticity principle. Let's advance to question five. Which AWS support plan offers assistance with billing and account management? AWS standard support, AWS business support, AWS premium support, or AWS enterprise on ramp? All right, let's check out the correct answer. D, AWS Enterprise OnRamp. AWS Enterprise OnRamp provides concierge support that specializes in working with the enterprise customers for billing and account related issues. This plan is designed for businesses running production workloads on AWS and needing faster response times and dedicated account assistance. Key benefits include access to AWS concierge, faster response times compared to lower tier support plans, and best practice guidance on account management and cost optimization. All right, incorrect options. AWS standard support, it is free and provides only basic account assistance. AWS Business Support provides technical support, but it is not specialized for billing and account management. And premium support simply doesn't exist. So watch out for this because sometimes there's tricky ones like this. All right. Question six, which AWS service helps developers compile and test their code? Code deploy, code catalyst, code build, or code commit? All right, let's reveal what is the answer, code build. So code build is a fully managed continuous integration service that compiles source code, runs tests, and produces software packages that are ready to deploy. So as mentioned, it is used to compile and test source code, helping you find and fix bugs easily early in the development process when they are easy to fix. Incorrect options. So code commit is used to store and version source code. Code deploy is used to deploy application code to a variety of compute services such as EC2, Fargate, Lambda, and your on-premises servers. Lastly, code pipeline is the glue that builds these steps together. It enables you to automate all phases of your release process from committing the code into your AWS code commit all the way to deploying it with AWS code deploy. So let's advance into question seven. Select the services that provide serverless and server-based compute options. Choose two. So I'd recommend you guys to always read the questions well. So select the services that provide serverless and server-based compute options, okay? So two types of computing options. So AWS Fargate, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon EMR, AWS Lambda, and Amazon Redshift. All right, so let's reveal the two options that are correct, EMR and Redshift. So let's get straight into the explanation. So some AWS services provide the option to run workloads on serverless or server-based compute options. For example, AWS customers have four Amazon EMR compute options to run their big data applications, EC2, 
EKS Outposts and EMR Serverless. So Amazon EMR Serverless is a new option in Amazon EMR that makes it easy for data analysts and engineers to run open source big data analytics frameworks without configuring, managing, and scaling clusters of servers. And for Redshift, it is a fully managed analytics service that offers both provisioned and serverless options. So both services fall into the category of having both provisioned and serverless options. For the incorrect options, we have AWS Lambda, which is only serverless, Fargate, which is again only serverless, and DynamoDB, which is again a fully managed serverless key value NoSQL database service. All right. So you can pause and read a little bit more in detail, but we're going to advance into Q8. What kind of reports does AWS Cost Explorer provide by default? So reports about historical on premises spending, reports about the results of AWS Trusted Advisor checks, reports about the utilization of Amazon Easy to Reserved instances, and detailed AWS usage reports delivered directly to to an Amazon S3 bucket. All right, let's reveal the correct answer, which is C, reports about the utilization of Amazon EC2 reserved instances. So AWS Coast Explorer lets you dive deeper into your AWS Coast and usage data to identify trends, pinpoint cost drivers, and detect anomalies. You can view data for up to the last 12 months, forecast how much you're likely to spend for the next 12 months, and get recommendations for what saving plans or reserved instances to purchase. So very useful service, guys. You should definitely know about Cost Explorer and the differences between cost and usage report. So it includes a breakdown of your top five cost accruing AWS services, an analysis of your overall Amazon EC2 usage, and an analysis of the total cost of your member accounts and reserved instance utilization and coverage reports. For the incorrect options, we have the AWS cost and and usage report, which is different than the reports provided by the AWS Cost Explorer. AWS Cost Explorer does not provide reports about historical on-premises spending. That is the job of the on-premises engineers, all right? That is not your job. You are not taking care of on-premises spending. AWS Cost Explorer does not provide reports about the results of AWS Trusted Advisor checks. So let's get into Q9. To protect against data loss, you need to back up your database regularly. What is the most cost-effective storage option that provides immediate retrieval of your backups. First option, Amazon S3 Glacier Deep Archive. Second option, Instant Store. Third option, Amazon S3 Standard Infrequent Access. And last option, Amazon EBS. Right, let's reveal the correct option, Amazon S3 standard in frequent access. So the S3 storage class you choose primarily depends upon two factors, the accessibility and the cost. So S3 standard in frequent access is the best choice because it provides immediate access to your database backups while reducing costs. So it is used for data that is accessed less frequently, but requires immediate access when needed. The incorrect options include EBS, which is not a cost effective solution for storing backups. It is a block level storage that can be used as a disk drive for Amazon on EC2 or RDS instances, and it is designed for application workloads that benefit from fine tuning for performance and capacity. S3 Glacier Deep Archive does not provide immediate retrieval. It is at least uh, 12 hours, all right? So S3 Glacier Deep Archive is the lowest cost storage class that supports long-term retention and digital preservation for data that may be accessed once or twice in a year. Instance Store can only be used to store temporary data. You cannot rely on Instance Store for valuable long-term data because data in the Instance Store is lost if the instance is stopped, terminated, or if the underlying disks fail. So let's get into Q10. Which of the below options are use cases for the Amazon Route 53 service choose to? Provides performance optimization recommendations, detects configuration changes in the AWS environment, DNS configuration and management, manages global application traffic through a variety of routing types, point-to-point -point connectivity between an on-premises data center and AWS. Right, let's reveal the two options, DNS configuration and management and managing global application traffic through a variety of 
routing types. I mean, the name indicates it. This one uh, was not that hard. So if you got it wrong, I recommend you guys to really get the practice exams. So Amazon Route 53 can be used for registering domain names, for DNS configuration and management, configuring health checks to route traffic only to healthy endpoints, managing global application traffic cross regions through a variety of routing types. And the incorrect options, Route 53 does not provide performance optimization recommendations. Route 53 is not used to detect configuration changes in the AWS environment. This is done through AWS config. So that's pretty much it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this short practice exam with explanations. If you did, please make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. If you want more of these, please let me know. Also, I highly recommend you guys to check out my course on Udemy with six practice exams, 390 questions. You can do a limited retakes and 100% exam coverage explanations for both correct and incorrect options. So I really, really think that it is something that will add so much value and help you pass the AWS Cloud Practitioner exam. So that's pretty much it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helped you. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you.